precancerous lesions of oral cavity. Lecture outlines. Reasons, clinical manifestation, diagnosis, differential diagnosis, treatment options of obligate precancers, optional precancers with high potency to malignancy, optional precancers with low potency to malignancy. The lower lip is the most frequent site of oral cancer overall, while the tongue is the most frequently affected site within the mouth. In the oral cavity, the majority of cancers are concentrated in the lower part of the mouth, particularly the lateral borders of the tongue. The adjacent flow of the mouth and lingual aspect of the alveolar margin forming a U-shaped area, extending back towards the oropharynx. A 70% percentage of oral cancers are concentrated there. This distribution may be due to the likelihood that carcinogens could pool and concentrate in the lower mouth before swallowing. For the same reason, the heart palate and central dorsum of tongue are very rarely affected. Oral cavity cancer accounts approximately 3% of all cancers. Most of them are oral squamous cell carcinoma. Oral squamous cell carcinoma is the 17th commonest cancer worldwide. And here you have the distribution of oral cancer among the parts of the oral cavity. The most prevalent, uh, it is buccal mucosa and tongue. There are many conditions of the oral mucosa that can progress to an invasive malignancy. A sort of understanding of these conditions is a requirement for all those involved in the management of the diseases of the oral mucosa and head and neck region. So, uh, <clears throat> the importance of early detection. Despite the general accessibility of the oral cavity during physical examination, many malignancies are not diagnosed until late stages of disease. In order to prevent malignant transformation of these precursor lesions, multiple screening and detection techniques have been developed to address this problem. The early detection of cancer is of critical importance because survival rates markedly improve when the oral lesion is identified at an early stage. A major challenge for early diagnosis of the at-risk tissue is our limited ability to differentiate oral precancerous lesions at high risk of progressing into invasive squamous cell carcinoma from those at low risk. The gold standard for oral cancer diagnosis remains tissue biopsy with histological assessment. But this technique needs a trained healthcare provider and is considered invasive, painful, expensive, and time consuming. So, modern advancements of oral cancer diagnosis are such. Uh, Basically, it is that what is called early detection. They are tolo toloidin blue dyes, oral CDX brush biopsy kits, salivary diagnostics, optical imaging systems. The most common ones that have been marketed to dentists, optical imaging systems are Visilite, Wellscope, D40, Identafi 3000. All these methods have their own advantages and disadvantages, but unfortunately, these non-invasive tools have failed in their practical implication in the community setup as patients are still being diagnosed in advanced stages of oral cancer. Hemiluminescence with light. It involves the use of a handheld single-use disposable hemiluminescent light stick that emits light at uh, 430 till 580 nanometers wavelengths. Normal epithelium will absorb light and appear dark, whereas hyperkeratinized or dysplastic lesions appear white. The difference in color could be related to altered epithelial thickness, 
or to the higher density of nuclear content and mitochondrial matrix that preferentially reflect light in keratinized mucosa. Well, scope. So healthy epithelial tissue will appear to be apple green in color, while those that are only slightly damaged will be dark due to the total loss of fluorescence. But the device is unable to discriminate high risk from low risk lesions. This device emits a blue light that illuminates the epithelium and inside it contains a digital camera capable of photographing tissues, as it is seen on this photo. Identafi 3000. Besides detection of autofluorescence similar to the Wellscope system, this device also examines tissue reflectance, which is based on the premise of detecting changes in angiogenesis with green amber light, 540 to 575 nanometers wavelength illumination. The amber light is sought to enhance the reflective properties of the oral mucosa, allowing a distinction between normal and abnormal tissue vasculature. Increased angiogenesis is a known process during oral carcinogenesis and oral cancer progression. And on these photos, you can see how the identafi optical system is used to suspicious lesion, showing loss of vasculature. And finally, goggles. It is special eyewear equipped with innovative optical filters used in conjunction with a curing light for oral cancer screening. So this technique enables rapid screening in only one to two minutes of internal surface areas of oral mucosa to provide an accurate, non-invasive aid for the detection of dysplasia and malignant lesions. The special optical filter allows to visualize anomalies. The tissue after fluorescence achieved Contribute, contributes to the detection of the margins of precancerous and cancerous lesions. And actually, it is goggles, and the doctor wearing goggles using UV light and um, checking oral mucosa. Toluidin blue. Theoretically, dysplastic and malignant cells have higher nuclear acid content than normal, and thus staining of suspicious lesions with this dye can aid recognition of mucosal changes. Toluidin blue has been used as a vital stain to highlight potentially malignant oral lesions since the early 1980s, and a positive staining of toluidin blue may appear as a dark royal blue, as here you can see. So lacoplachic area is uh, colored. Oral CDX brush biopsy. It uses the concept of exfoliative cytology to provide a cytological evaluation of a cellular dysplastic changes. The oral CDX provides a complete transepithelial sample as the brush extends deep in the epithelial layers. The oral cytological epithelial samples are fixed onto a glass slide stained with a modified Papa Nicola test and analyzed microscopically via a computer-based imaging system. So this photo shows that brush should be pressed until the pin point of blood is visible, and only after that uh, it is considered to be done correctly. Saliva as diagnostic tool. So saliva from patients has been used in a novel way to provide molecular biomarkers for oral cancer detection. So far, saliva has been used to detect carriers risk, periodontitis, oral cancer, breast cancer, salivary gland diseases, and systemic disorders such as human immunodeficiency virus and hepatitis C virus. However, due to lack of knowledge of disease markers and an overall low concentration of these markers in saliva when compared to serum, the diagnostic value of saliva has not been fully realized. However, nowadays, highly sensitive and high throughput assays, such as DNA microarray, mass spectrometry, and nanoscale sensors can measure protein and RNA markers at low concentrations in saliva, thus expanding the utility of saliva as a liquid for diagnosis. 
and summary of this short chapter from, of diagnosis. So dentist knowledge and education in detecting oral cancer and its precancerous phase is the key to prevent its progression to later stages. In order to improve early detection, it is imperative to increase the healthcare provider's depth of knowledge about oral cancer, their risk factors and the most common oral precancerous conditions. A precancerous condition is a condition or lesion involving abnormal cells which are associated with an increased risk of developing into cancer. Clinically, precancerous conditions encompass a variety of conditions or lesions with an increased risk of developing into cancer. So, premalignant condition is defined by World Health Organization workshop that was held in 2005 as it is a group of disorders of varying etiologies characterized by mutagen-associated spontaneous or hereditary alterations or mutations in the genetic material of oral epithelial cells with or without clinical and histomorphological alterations that may lead to oral squamous cell carcinoma transformation. So that is the definition by premalignant condition that we are talking about on this lecture. <clears throat> Prior to start, we need to uh, outline some terminology. So sometimes the term precancer is also used for carcinoma in situ, which is a non-invasive cancer that has not progressed to an aggressive invasive stage. As with other precancerous conditions, not all carcinoma in situ will progress to invasive disease. So other names that you can find somewhere in the books, uh, scientific articles uh, that are synonyms to precancer condition are premalignant condition, precancer, premalignancy, dysplasia, intraepithelial neoplasm, carcinoma in situ. All of that are synonyms to one term, precancer. Classification. Obligate precancer can be abrasive, precancerous chelitis manhanoti, Bowen's disease, warty precancer or varicose precancer, local precancerous hyperkeratosis of the red border, erythroplasia. Optional precancers are divided for those with high potency to malignancy and those for low potency to malignancy. Uh, optional precancers with uh, high potency to malignancy are proliferative varicose leicoplakia, squamous papilloma of heart pellet, papillomatosis, cutaneous orn, keratoacantoma. Optional precancers with low potency to malignancy as such, homogeneous leicoplakia, also it is stamped leicoplakia, sick uh, leicoplakia of flat type leicoplakia, lesion planus, erosive or ulcerative type, meteorological chelitis, actinic chelitis, chronic lip fissure, chronic ulcers of oral cavity, post X-ray chelitis, and stomatitis. So that what we have discussed on the previous lecture. Uh, <clears throat> radiation induced mucositis. And uh, one by one, we will discuss every entity. So obligate precancers and we start from abrasive precancerous chelitis of Manganotti. So this pathology got its name because it was first described in great detail in 1933 by the dermatologist Manganotti. So this doctor noted that in such patients, chelitis manifests itself mainly as the appearance of skin defects on the red body of the lips, with the result that over time the process almost always transforms into lip cancer. Here you can see a photo. They are not good, but uh, there is visible 
pathological alteration on the lip mucosa. So reasons for abrasive precancerous chelitis of Manhanoti as such. First of all, it is disturbance of metabolic processes in the skin and the mucous membrane of the lips that leads to atrophy. Predisposing factors could be tooth loss in the elderly people, varying prothesis, so it means chronic local injury to the area where prothesis uh, do some um, uh, injury. Triggers to abrasive precancerous cellulitis of manganoti as such. Direct sunlight, one time or permanent injury to the skin of the lips, deficiency of vitamin A, disorders of the digestive system, and of course, risk group, like all malignant neoplastic diseases, most often develops at an older age people, about 60 years. And for this particular um, precancerous cellulitis of manganoti, mainly males are ill. Symptoms. Mainly affected lower lip. Lesions have the appearance of small at first defects in the area of the red border of the lips, which are round or oval, sometimes irregular. Their surface is smooth as if polished. It has a bright red color. In some patients, thin layers of preserved skin cells in the form of thin films remain on the surface of the defects. Lesion may be crusted when crusts are removed with a spatula. You can uh, get bleeding. Interestingly, when injuring defects where there are no crusts, bleeding never happens. Defects are localized on virtually unchanged skin. Swelling and compaction of it is almost never detected. A characteristic feature of this pathology is that the inflammatory processes are often quite unstable. They can appear and disappear anytime. Diagnosis. So correct diagnosis is based only on the data of external examination of the patient. In doubtful cases, it is necessary to take smears and scrapings from the area of pathological lesions on the lip and make their research under a microscope. Differential diagnosis is done with such diseases. Erosive forms of systemic lupus erythematosus, lichen planus and leicoplakia, pemphigus erythema, multiform, and herpetic skin lesions. Erosive forms of systemic lupus erythematosus. First of all, uh, together with the lesion on the lip, uh, lupus erythematosus always have this special typical butterfly-like pattern on the skin uh, of the cheeks and nose. Always is present. Lichen planus erosive form. Uh, Lip mucosa is not so typical for lichen planus. Lichen planus favorite place is buccal mucosa. But sometimes it can happen in lips as well. So in this case, necessary to do pathohistological uh, diagnosis. Erythema multiform and pemphigus. Erythema multiform has not only um, pathological elements on skin of lips, but uh, these elements will be present as well in oral cavity, in uh, buccal mucosa, uh, pe heart palate, uh, alveolar ridge, so anywhere in the oral cavity. At the same time, it can have skin manifestation. Uh, the most typical for erythema multiform that this lesion has targets, a targeted lesion, circled. And one more that uh, multiform, it means that uh, erythema, vesicles and popping vesicles are present at the same time. So three uh, generations of uh, lesions available at the same time in oral cavity. And leicoplakia. Leicoplakia has uh, localization on lips, mucosa, but it looks like a whitish um, plaque whitish plaque on the labial mucosa. 
treatment options conservative and surgical so conservative first of all find and eliminate reason Topically can be applied such medicans, medicaments, vitamin A in the form of application on the lesion, ointments with drugs of adrenal hormones, cytotoxic drugs, drugs that promote the healing of the skin. Intraoral medicaments, vitamin P, A, drugs that help improve blood flow in small, in small vessels. Surgical. So after one month of conservative treatment, treatment if, if it was not effective, a surgical treatment is done. The only treatment for cheilitis mangonoti, which contributes to almost 100% recovery, is surgery. So surgery, it is option uh, for recovery of 100%. Prognosis of this disease is favorable, but only in cases where the treatment was promptly carried out and the development of a malignant tumor has not yet occurred. Prevention. Very carefully protect the sore lip from any, even the slightest injury. Spend less time in the sun and correct prosthetic treatment if uh, it causes injury to oral mucosa. All of these measures apply not only to the sick per patient, but also to the elderly people with predisposing factors. So that will be uh, the main uh, steps in prevention of abrasive precancerous cheilitis of manganotti. Bowen's disease is a very early form of skin cancer that's easily treatable. First described by the American dermatologist John Bowen, 1912. Bowen disease is a squamous cell carcinoma in situ with the potential for significant lateral spread. The main sign is a red scaly patch on the skin. This is a kind of skin cancer that affects the upper layer epidermis of the skin. Another name for it is squamous cell carcinoma in situ. In situ means cancer sits in the upper layer and has not spread into deeper ones. Reasons. The exact cause is unclear, but it's been closely linked with aging, long-term exposure to the sun, having a weak immune system, previously having radiotherapy treatment, the human papilloma virus and chronic arsenic exposure. Symptoms. Bowen's disease causes reddish, sometimes brown, patches on sun-damaged skin, most often on your legs. Bowen's disease usually appears as a patch on the skin that has clear edges and does not heal. Some people have more than one patch. The patch may be red or pink, scaly or crusty, flat or raised, up to a few centimeters across and more, itchy but not all the time. The patch can appear anywhere on the skin, but it is especially common on exposed areas like the lower legs, neck and head. If the patch bleeds, starts to turn into an open sore or develops a lump, it could be a sign it's turned into squamous cell carcinoma. So that is the time to get a medical care. Diagnosis and differential diagnosis of Bowen's disease is done with psoriasis, and eczema. So psoriasis usually affects scalp or skin of the joints. Eczema is often widespread but can also develop as a solitary skin lesions. As such, the appearance of eczema can sometimes be confused with skin cancer. Skin cancer forms in areas of the body exposed to sunlight. Squamous cell carcinoma is often characterized by reddish, scaly patches on the skin. Lesions can have adherent scale and have a thicker or firmer texture than eczema patches. So to clarify any diagnosis, biopsy is done. 
treatment options of bovine disease, cryotherapy, topical hemotherapy, curettage and cautery, photodynamic therapy, surgery. So these are the possible options of treatment. Warty precancer or varicose precancer. This disease was described in Mashkilason in 1965 for the first time. So it occurs exclusively on the red border of lower lip. It is warty formation in the form of a hemispherical node for 10 millimeters in diameter, which rises above the level of the mucosa by 4-5 millimeters. It is placed on the unchanged red border. The top of the node is covered with tightly attached gray scales. It should be differentiated from papilloma, keratoacantoma, pyogenic granuloma. Papilloma, it is whitish formation with papillary growth on its surface. It has different localization, not only on the lips. It can be on alveolar ridge, tongue, anywhere in the uh, oral cavity. Keratoacantoma, it is gray, red, nodule with a crater-like depression in the center, which is filled with horny masses. That is keratoacantoma. A keratoacantoma can develop not only on the lip, but uh, at any mucosa that is subjected to sun. It can be mucosa of eyes as well. Piohenic granuloma. It is, uh, it is on the lip, pyogenic granuloma. But this one can develop uh, in different areas of oral mucosa. So it is higher than other tissues, formation of the red border of the lip with saturated red color and soft texture, reddish yellow ulcerated superficial nodule involving the mucocutaneous line. Pyogenic granuloma is a benign, non-neoplastic mucocutaneous lesion. It is a reactional response to constant minor trauma and might be related to hormonal changes. High level of steroid hormones in females. In the mouse, pyogenic granuloma is manifested as a sessile, opedunculated, resilient, exophytic, erythematous and painless papule or nodule with a smooth, or lobulated surface that bleeds easily. Pyogenic granuloma frequently located surrounding the anterior teeth or skin that is considered to be neoplastic in nature. It affects the gingiva, but may also occur on the lips, tongue, oral mucosa, and palate. The most common treatment for this is surgical excision. Treatment options of warty precancer is total surgical removal of the lesion within healthy tissues. Local precancerous hyperkeratosis of the red border. So the lips, uh, so the, this disease was described by Maischke in 1965. The disease mainly affects middle-aged men. Localization of defects are on the red border of the lower lip laterally. It is typical. I even highlight laterally. Shape. Usually it is focus of keratinization of gray-white polygonal shape over two millimeters inside. It does not rise above the level of the epithelium and sometimes is depressed. The surface is covered with thin, tightly attached scales. The tissues surrounding the lesion are unchanged. Palpation of limited hyperkeratosis gives the feeling of a dense surface plate. Malignancy occurs in a few months, four, six months, or sometimes years. Differential diagnosis is done with leicoplakia, a white patch is a typical element of lesion with possible formation of cracks and erosions on it. 
Common site for leicoplakia is buccal mucosa, mandibula, gingiva, tongue, flow of the mouth. Lesion planus is characterized by the presence of miliary polygonal papules with possible, with possible formation of erosions on them. And here you can see erosive lesion planus of the lips. Usually it has bilateral localization. It is never located uh, on one side of the lip. Treatment options of local limited precancerous hyperkeratosis of the red border is surgical, total surgical excision of the lesion with, within healthy tissues. Erythroplasia. The term erythroplasia was proposed by Louis K. Rudd in 1911. Erythroplakia is analogous to the term leicoplakia, which describes white patches. Together, these are the two traditionally accepted types of premalignant lesions in the mouse. Also, oral erythroplakia is much less common than leicoplakia. Erythroplakia carries a significantly higher risk of containing dysplasia or carcinoma in situ. In 1933, Salzberger and Satterstein recognized erythroplasia of Kerat as a form of carcinoma in situ and of eventually transforming into invasive squamous cell carcinoma, that is the type of oral cancer. Definition of uh, erythroplasia or erythroplakia. <clears throat> also often, these terms erythroplasia and erythroplakia are used synonymously. Some sources distinguish them, stating that the later is a macula flat, while the former erythroplakia is a papula bumpy, excuse me, erythroplasia, papula bumpy, erythroplakia flat uh, and macula. Another name is speckled leicoplakia as well. Reasons of erythroplakia. Usually cause is unknown, but researchers presume it to be similar to the causes of squamous cell carcinoma, as it is found in almost 40% of erythroplakia cases. Age. Elderly men around the ages of 65-74 are predisposed to this pathology, and of course it is associated with smoking. Clinical manifestation of erythroplasia as such. Red patches, the surface is frequently velvety in texture and the margin may be sharply defined. Erythroplasia of the tongue here is described, and this is slightly, here it is slightly depressed, well-defined red patch on the dorsolateral tongue showed squamous carcinoma on the biopsy. This term applies, speckled leicoplakia is applies to lesions consisting of white flecks of fine nodules on an atrophic erythematous base. Speckled leicoplakia can be regarded as a combination of or transition between leicoplakia and erythroplasia. Speckled leicoplakia also more frequently shows dysplasia than lesions with a homogeneous white surface. Dysplasia means malignization. Differential diagnosis of an oral red Lesion, erythroplasia actually is red lesion. Leicoplakia is white lesion. So diagnosis of erythroplasia is done with solid chancre, tuberculosis, leicoplakia, squamous cell carcinoma. So solid chancre, the development of a solid chancre also begins with the presence of limited redness, but in the center of it in two, three days, there is a ceiling due to infiltration. In the central part of the infiltrate chancre, a development of necrosis and erosion formation of bright red color are typical. Tuberculosis. 
there is a characteristic enlargement of the lymph node of the affected site. In case of tuberculosis, red or yellow-red lumps of soft consistency are formed with a diameter of 1-3 mm that are subjected to cheesy disintegration and formation of ulcers. Lacoplachia. In the case of lacoplachia, white patches of keratosis with subsequent ulceration are present. And squamous cell carcinoma, if it is suspected, should be done biopsy, and only due to biopsy <clears throat> it can be revealed. <clears throat> Treatment options. Treatment involves biopsy of the lesion to identify extent of dysplasia. Complete excision of the lesion is sometimes advised depending on the histopathology found in the biopsy. Even in these cases, recurrence of the erythroplakia is common and thus long-term monitoring is needed. Biopsy data will reveal such. Microscopically, the tissue exhibits severe epithelial dysplasia, carcinoma in situ, or invasive squamous cell carcinoma in 90% of cases. There is an absence of keratin production and a reduced number of epithelial cells. Since the underlying vascular structures are less hidden by tissue, erythroplakia appears red when viewed in a clinical setting. We proceed to optional precancer that has high potency to malignancy. And the first one, it is proliferative verrucose lacoplachia. It is a rare form of oral lacoplachia that was first reported in 1985 by Hansen. It is disease with aggressive biological behavior due to its high probability of recurrence and a high rate of malignant transformation, usually higher than 70%. Proliferative verrucose lacoplachia is a long-term progressive condition, which observed more frequently in elderly women uh, over 60 years at the time of diagnosis. Reasons for such disease is uncertain, but there is association with human papilloma virus and uh, there also has been reported association with Epstein-Barr virus and Candida infection. Clinical manifestation of proliferative verrucose lacoplachia. First of all, localization. Usually this disease, uh, this, um, disease is localized bilaterally on the buccal mucosa, alveolar ridge, and tongue. Proliferative verrucose lacoplachia may occur both in smokers and non-smokers. Thus, tobacco does not seem to have a significant influence. It develops initially as a white plaque of hyperkeratosis that eventually becomes a multifocal disease with proliferative features and progressive deterioration of the lesion. So, uh, lacoplachia on the alveolar ridge and lacoplachia Kick lesion, multifocal smooth and verrucose plaque on the dorsal tongue. Diagnosis. Because of the lack of specific histological criteria, the diagnosis of proliferative verrucose lacoplachia is based on combined clinical and histopathologic evidence of progression. Set of diagnostic criteria that are mentioned as follows. The lesion starts as homogeneous lacoplachia without evidence of dysplasia at the first. With time, some areas of lacoplachia become varicose. The disease progresses to the development of multiple isolated or confluent lesions at the same or a different site with time. The disease progresses through the different histopathological stages. The appearance of new lesions after treatment and a follow-up period of no less than one year. Differential diagnosis. The clinical differential diagnosis are such homogeneous lacoplachia, frictional keratosis, squamous papilloma, verrucose hyperplasia, verrucose carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, chronic hyperplastic candidiasis. So homogeneous lacoplachia and proliferative verrucose lacoplachia. What is similar, what is different? So homogeneous lacoplachia is a more common 
seen predominantly in males, male-female ratio 2 to 1. It has higher correlation with tobacco and alcohol use, has moderate rate of malignant transformation, 325 percentage, and has a moderate mortality. Proliferative verrucose leicoplakia is relatively uncommon, seen predominantly in women, male-female ratio 1 to 4, it has lower correlation with tobacco and alcohol use. It has high rate of malignant transformation, 70-80%, and has high mortality. Frictional keratosis and verrucose carcinoma. As regards to other lesions that mimic uh, proliferative verrucose leicoplakia, like frictional keratosis, it will have a clinically identifiable cause. So, dentists can uh, ask patient about bad habit of cheek biting and actually this is chronic in sleep cancer habit by the way cheek biting chronic in sleep cancer habit but dentists can find out it from anamnesis such frictional keratosis at the same time other entities like squamous papilloma verrucose carcinoma chronic hyperplastic candidiasis can be diagnosed by their different histological features on this photo there is verrucose carcinoma it is a relatively rare well differentiated variant of squamous cell carcinoma with a specific clinical appearance and histopathologic features it can grow large in size and could be locally destructive with low rate of metastasis so verrucose Carcinoma. Chronic hyperplastic candidiasis and proliferative verrucose leicoplakia. Uh, so, hyperplastic candidiasis and, excuse me, not and, but or, it is synonym, candidal leicoplakia. It is a persistent white lesion characterized by keratinization, parakeratosis and chronic intraepithelial inflammation with fungal hepha invading the superficial layers of the epithelium. Treatment options. This lesion is resistant to the presently available treatment modalities. Therefore, few methods were effective. Laser ablation, topical photodynamic therapy cause relatively low morbidity and no scarring, and total excision with free surgical margins. It is, cr is critical combined with a lifelong follow-up. Prognosis of this disease is poor. At present, the etiology of proliferative verrucose leicoplakia remains unclear as well as its management and diagnosis, which is still retrospective, late, and poorly defined with lacking consensus criteria. Squamous papilloma of heart palate another disease. So the World Health Organization defines papilloma as a range of localized hyperplastic, exophytic, and polypoid lesions of hyperplastic epithelium with a verrucose or cauliflower-like morphology. Squamous papilloma commonly occur between age 30 and 50 years and sometimes can occur before the age of 10 years, so in children. Oral squamous papilloma accounts for 8% of all oral tumors in children. Clinical manifestation of oral squamous papilloma. It is a benign proliferation of the stratified squamous epithelium with papillary appearance induced by human papilloma virus. Cause, asymptomatic and have small progression. Localization, tongue, soft palate, uvula, any other surface of the oral cavity such as vermilion of the lip. And this photo squamous papilloma in the labial surface uh, close to the tooth 22. Differential diagnosis. So these oral squamous papilloma should be clinically and histologically differentiated from, pay attention, clinically and histologically, should be differentiated from fibroma, veruciform xanthoma, papillary hyperplasia, condyloma acuminatum. Veruciform xanthoma versus uh, squamous papilloma. Veruciform xanthoma. It has a distinct predilection for gingiva and the alveolar ridge only. For opposite, squamous papilloma can be on heart palate. 
It is hyperplastic epithelium with a verrucose or cauliflower-like morphology. Inflammatory papillary hyperplasia or dentia stomatitis. Reasons, first of all, necessary to outline trauma and candida infection. So common in palatal mucosa as multiple elevations, raspberry-like appearance, bright red in color. And in anamnesis, varying of prothesis. Condyloma acuminatum. The condyloma would be larger than the papilloma, it would have a broader base and uh, would appear pink to red as a result of less keratinization. It is usually transmitted sexually. A finding of condyloma acuminatum in the oral cavity is rare. Oral fibroma versus oral squamous papilloma. An oral fibroma is a common benign scare-like reaction to persistent long-standing irritation in the mouth. It is smooth papule in the mouth with the same color as the rest of the mouth lining. Do not develop into oral cancer. Treatment options. Treatment of choice for these lesions is surgical removal that is performed with electrocautery, cold steel excision, laser ablation, cryosurgery, or intralesional injections of interferon. Taneus orn. It may arise from a wide range of the epidermal lesions, which may be benign, premalignant, or malignant. Cotaneous orn is a clinical diagnosis that refers to a conical projection above the surface of the skin. The lesions typically occur in sun exposed areas, particularly the face, ear, nose, forearms, dorsum of hands. Even though 60% of the cutaneous orns are benign, the possibility of skin cancer should always be kept in mind. The reasons for this disease. Actually, high risk groups include people with fair skin, those with human papilloma virus, older adults and individuals with a lot of sun damage. Clinical manifestation. A cutaneous on it is generally presents as a straight or curved, hard, yellow brown projection from the skin. It can be surrounded by normal skin or have a border of secant skin. The site of the horn may be terrace-like or oyster shell-like with horizontal ridges. The base of the horn may be flat, protruding, or like a crater. Inflammation may be present uh, inflammation may be present due to recurrent injury. So, worrying features suggestive of malignancy. Though no certain features can confidently confirm or exclude malignant lesions, malignant lesions are more common in older patients and in males compared to females. Squamous cell carcinoma is also likely if the horn has the following features. Painful, large size, in duration of the base, anatomic site on the nose, ears, backs of hands, skull, forearms, face, wide base, or low height to base ratio, redness at the base of the horn, lack of terrace formation due to rapid unorganized growth. Actually, this photo is of squamous cell carcinoma that arise from cutaneous horn. Diagnosis of cutaneous horn is done by its clinical appearance. Histological examination of the horn base is crucial to rule out malignancy. As there are no certain clinical features that can definitely distinguish benign lesions from skin cancer. The lesion is usually completely cut out. In some cases, a deep partial biopsy is taken to establish the diagnosis.
of skin conditions that are associated with cutaneous arms. Benign. Seborrheic keratos, epidermal nevus, viral warp, molluscum contaginosum, ostracheus psoriasis, hypertrophic lesion planus. Premalignant conditions. Actinic keratosis, intraepidermal carcinoma, keratoacantoma, squamosal carcinoma, melanoma, rara, rea. So these conditions can be associated with cutaneous orn. Treatment. If the lesion is benign, no further treatment may be needed. But if the lesion is precancerous, the physician may freeze lesion with liquid nitrogen, use topical hemotherapy agent, scrap and burn, curettage and electrodesiccation of the lesion. So if the lesion is cancerous, the physician may perform surgery, use topical hemotherapy agent, scrape and burn, recommend radiation therapy. Keratoacantoma. It is relatively common low-grade tumor that originates in opilosebaceous glands and closely resembles squamous cell carcinoma. In fact, strong arguments support classifying keratoacantoma as a variant of invasive squamous cell carcinoma. Reasons. The exact etiology is unknown. Ultraviolet light exposure is likely the main cause for the formation of keratoacantoma. There is a genetic predisposition. There is a possible association with the human papilloma virus. And on this photo, keratoacantoma that arises from the hair follicle skin cells for unknown reasons. Keratoacantomas around firm, usually flesh colored nodules with sharply sloping borders and a characteristic central crater containing keratinous masses. They usually resolve spontaneously, but some may be a well-differentiated form of squamous cell carcinoma. Common sites for this disease are sun-exposed areas, face, forearms, dorsum of the hands. Spontaneous involution may start within a few months but involution is not guaranteed. Diagnosis. Diagnosis is done by biopsy, <clears throat> histopathological diagnosis. Differential diagnosis should be done with invasive squamous cell carcinoma, basal cell carcinoma, deep fungal or mycobacterial infection, molluscum contagiosum. Actually, here I put this photo of molluscum contagiosum. Treatment and prevention. Treatment requires the destruction of the lesion. Options include cryotherapy, curettage coat and coterie, excision, radiotherapy. Prevention, to enjoy sun safely. So uh, it is unclear whether keratoacantoma risk increases with increasing ultraviolet exposure, but still it is recommended to prevent such a disease uh, to hide uh, during the daytime when there is a high possibility uh, of sun radiation starting from uh, 11 o'clock till 3 o'clock, wear long sleeved clothes, wear hat, uh, sunglasses, uh, use UV filter cream. So uh, we have finished with optional precancer with high potency to malignancy and proceed with optional precancer with low potency for malignancy. The first entity it is meteorological chelitis. The given type of chelitis is a separate disease manifested by an inflammatory process affecting the skin and lip mucosa and is caused by various meteorological factors. The duration of such factors and individual peculiarities of the skin play an important role in the disease development. Reasons. 
people working in the open air, unfavorable weather conditions of any season, increased or decreased air humid humidity, high level of air dust, a strong wind, low temperature, sun exposure. But mostly this disease is prevalent in men. Risk factors such people with white skin, those who have some skin diseases accompanied by excessive dryness, seborrhea, seborrheic eczema, atopic dermatitis and others, and of course immunodeficiency conditions. Clinical manifestations mostly affect lower lip. The initial stage, mild peeling, dryness and disappearance of a clear cut border between red border and the skin of the lip. This is the typical manifestation. Disappearance of this line, direct clear visible line, red border and skin. When the unfavorable effect is prolonged, small dry whitish areas are formed on the lips. The skin on the lower lip seekens. Professor, what happened? Uh, problem with internet, maybe just uh, like kick me out. Huh. We continue. Okay. Hassan, no okay. we continue lecture. Don't worry, everything is okay. But the problem is, us how to continue from that what we have stopped. Okay, meteorological chelitis. We continue with, with this disease. So if not treated, the process may become chronic with the appearance of ulcers and crusts in the place of their healing. The ulcers themselves signal about the transformation of the inflammatory process and malignization. Diagnosis. 
Carefully taking anamnesis is most important for making a correct diagnosis because there are no specific laboratory methods for detecting meteorological chelitis. It is necessary to determine the relationship between the appearance of the disease and the effect of unfavorable weather conditions. If the patient has been ill for several years, the diagnosis is obvious. Differential diagnosis of meteorological chelitis is done with another chelitis, atopic chelitis. For example, spreads both to the lower, uh, lower and upper lips, affecting the skin around the lip and the corners of the lip. The disease is characterized by the periods of exacerbations and remissions. Actinic chelitis, especially dry form, affect the lower lip, similar to meteorologic chelitis but develops due to a long time of sun exposure. That is the difference. Contact allergic chelitis only develops following a contact with uh, an allergen. When removing the causative agent, the manifestations of the disease disappear. In this case, the red lip, rim, and the small skin area around the mouth are usually affected. Exfoliative chelitis, dry form. An inflammation spreads from red lip border with the mucous membrane to the middle of the red rim. From the red border to the middle of the red rim. Uh -huh, here it spreads. It do not spread downward to the skin. And treatment. To remove completely or at least partially the effect of unfavorable environmental factors on the skin. That is the first point. Second, medicaments. Vitamin A, E, C, P, and PP are usually administered. In severe cases, steroids in ointments locally prescribed. Prevention and prognosis. So prevention, regular use of hygienic lipstick with aloe, Protective sun cramps and ointments. Prognosis is usually positive, but at the advanced stage of the disease, when the patient does not receive proper treatment and preventive therapy, meteorological chelitis can gradually lead to the development of the lower lip cancer. Actinic chelitis, it is a variety of meteorologic chelitis. So actinic chelitis is a lip inflammation caused by long-term sunlight exposure. Actinic chelitis most often appears in people over 40 and is more common in men than women. People who spend a lot of time in the sun are most likely to develop actinic chelitis. It may be painless, but it can lead to squamous cell carcinoma if left untreated. Squamous cell carcinoma, once again, I'm reminded it is skin cancer. Reasons for actinic chelitis. It is long-term sunlight exposure. It takes years of intense sun exposure to cause actinic chelitis. Risk factors, landscapers, fishermen, professional outdoor athletes, people with light skin tones. Symptoms, uh, dry, chapped lips. May turn white or scaly. Almost always painless. So red, swollen or, or white patch on a lower lip predominantly. So actinic chelitis, lower lip predominantly. Types of actinic chelitis. Dry form and exudative form. Dry form recalls the symptoms of dry exfoliative chelitis, only the disease appears on the lower lip. Similar, see uh, this um, uh, uh, line between red rim, uh, red uh, border and skin is hidden, so it is very close to the meteorologic chelitis, but predominantly uh, only on the lower lip. Also, and white lesion as well is typical. 
diffuse blurring diffuse blurring between the border of the lip and the skin exudative form there is swelling of the red border of the lower lip some areas become pronounced red Diagnosis is done due to anamnesis of life and disease and objective examination. If necessary, biopsy is done. So prevention of actinic chelitis is similar to any disease that is um, uh, influenced by sun exposure. To hide yourself and um, prevent staying on the direct sun from 11 o'clock till 3 p.m. Uh, wear long sleeved clothes and a cap. Always try to hide shade if possible and use UV uh, filter cramps. If it goes about lips as well, it is recommended to use lip bulbs with aloe vera. Treatment. Medications. Nicotinic acid and other B vitamins, steroids, uh, such ointment topically. Flucinar, fluorouracil ointments, uh, prescribed for two, three weeks. Once again, topically. Cryotherapy, it is the most common treatment. Electrosurgery and carbon dioxide laser to ablate the vermilion border. Chronic lip fissure. It represents a persistent linear ulcer in the sagittal plane of the upper or lower lip vermilion. The lesion car carries malignant potentiality due to constant splitting and occasional tearing of the tissues. At the same time, chronic fissure is the entrance for the microorganisms because of constant wound presence. So chronic lip fissure. The condition affects approximately 0.6 of the population and the etiology is unclear, but contributory factors are such. Cold weather, smoking, bacterial or fungal infections, vitamin deficiency, mouse breathing, misaligned anterior teeth, and plain wind instruments. Of course, do not forget about Down syndrome and Crohn disease. For these uh, disorders as well, lip fissure can be a symptom. Clinical manifestation. Lower lip fissures tend to occur at the midline. Upper lip fissures often occur laterally to the midline. Chronic lip fissures have been reported more often in males than females. <clears throat> the fissure can cause pain, bleeding and aesthetic concern. The lesion may be present continuously or intermittently and symptoms often worsen during the winter months. Treatment options. Various topical treatments are reported. However, refractory lesions may necessitate simple excision or excision with Z plasty. Alternative treatment methods include cryotherapy and carbon dioxide laser therapy. But the most effective uh, method that uh, acts for 100% it is surgical excision of the lesion. <coughs> and finally, or, uh, oral lesion planus, erosive verrucose type. So oral lesion planus is an ongoing chronic inflammatory condition that affects mucous membranes inside the mouth. Oral lesion planus may appear as white, lacy patches, weak hamstria, red, swollen tissues or open sores. These lesions may cause burning, pain or other discomfort. Epidemiology. Lichen planus affects approximately 2% of the population with 57 or more being women over the age of 50. In about 1-3% of cases, long-standing erosive lichen planus can result in cancer, squamous cell carcinoma of the mouse. The term Wickhamstria was coined by Louis Frederick Wickham in the year 1895 and corresponds to fine white or gray lines or dots seen on the top of the papula rush and oral mucosal lesions of lesion planus. 
reasons for erosive uh, lesion planus. The etiology of lesion in general is unknown, but however, the disease is classified as a cell-mediated immune response, where immune cells called T lymphocytes attack the epidermal cells of affected areas. Since a specific antigen has not been identified, many researchers do not classify lichen planus as a true autoimmune disease, which destroys basal epithelial cells. Hepatitis C is well known to be associated with lichen planus. Like other forms of lichen planus, erosive lichen planus may be drug-induced and often results with the removal of the offending agent. For example, diabetic patients. Uh, to this group of patients, lichen plan erosive types of lichen planus is typical. Uh, diabetic patients. Epidemiology. So, similar to other presentations of lichen planus, erosive lichen planus occurs most commonly between the 50s and 80s. Women develop erosive lichen planus at about twice the rate of men. Clinical manifestation. In the mouse, erosions and ulcers may be the only signs in the form of ulcerative stomatitis. They may occur on buccal mucosa, labial mucosa, tongue, vermilion border. Unlike short-lasting after ulcers, erosive lichen planus lesions are larger and more irregular, and they may persist for weeks or longer. It can be very painful to eat, resulting in a weight loss, nutritional deficiencies, and depression. Other forms of oral lichen planus may also occur, including white, lacy stria, and inflammation or peeling of the gums in the form of desquamative gingivitis. Often the lesions are bilateral and symmetrical. Mucosal bleeding may occur with minimal trauma, such as with tooth brushing. The development of new erosions at sites of minimal trauma, known as the Kobner phenomenon. So it is also common for verrucose erosive lichen planus. After the eventual resolution of erosive lesions, scarring and post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation are very common. Diagnosis of erosive lichen planus is often made by the typical history and clinical appearance. A biopsy may be recommended to confirm the diagnosis and to look for cancer. Histopathological signs of lichenoid tissue reaction affecting the epidermis, skin cell layer, are supportive. However, the ulcerating nature of the disorder means that the epidermis may be missing so that lichenoid features may not be observed. The pathologist may describe a brisk inflammatory infiltrate in the mucosa, but this is nonspecific. And uh, another method of diagnosis is direct immunofluorescent st staining of tissue. <clears throat> Here you have the description of this direct immunofluorescence. I will send to you this presentation so you can uh, read by yourself. Differential diagnosis. Differential diagnosis for erosive lichen planus may vary based on the affected location. Crohn disease may present with erosions of the oral cavity, vulva, or perineum, or anus, and may present years before any bowel findings. Autoimmune bullous diseases may present clinically identical to erosive lesion planus and can be differentiated by immunofluorescent studies. Bechet syndrome, erythema multiform, Stevens-Johnson syndrome all may present in ways clinically similar to erosive lesion planus. For differential diagnosis, necessary to do biopsy and to provide uh, correct and appropriate clinical examination. When occurring in the oral cavity, the differential diagnosis for erosive lesion planus should comprise oropharyngeal candidiasis, leukoplakia, squamosal carcinoma, leukodema, and allergic contact mucositis. Treatment. The management of erosive lichen planus may be very challenging, as it is a chronic disease. 
topical and systemic treatment may be required intermittently or continuously long term. Topical steroids and systemic steroids. So topical steroids are generally applied daily. They are the mainstay of therapy in most patients. Uh, treatment duration one, three, uh, maintenance treatment once three times per week or more. Often may be necessary long term treatment should be applied to the eroded areas two or three times daily. And systemic steroids such as prednisone or pred may be prescribed for a few weeks or longer, usually at dose of 0 0.51 milligram kilogram per day. Once the erosions have healed, the dose is tailed off. Long term use of systemic steroids may have serious side effects. In many patients, calcium and vitamin D should also be prescribed to reduce the chance of corticosteroid-induced bone thinning. Prognosis. The lesions of erosive lichen planus are often persistent and tend to respond poorly to therapy. Attacks of the disease usually last for years and relapses are frequent even when maintenance therapy is appropriately utilized. In conclusion, to avoid precancerous lesion formation and development, it is necessary to avoid commercial tobacco, limit alcohol use, be vaccinated against human papilloma virus, to limit sun exposure, and of course, the most important, to be healthy, necessary to maintain healthy weight and be active, do some out of door activities. References. Different textbooks and different uh, web pages, uh, a lot of articles. Uh, if necessary, I can share with you. So, thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor. For you as well, thank you.